A reading from the second book of Kings. Naaman, the army commander of the king of Aram, was highly esteemed and respected by his master, for through him the Lord had brought victory to Aram. But valiant as he was, the man was a leper. Now the Ar Ar Arameans had captured in a raid on the land of Israel a little girl who became the servant of Naaman's wife. If only my master would present himself to the prophet in Samaria, she said to her mistress, he would cure him of his leprosy. Naaman went and told his lord just what the slave girl from the land of Israel had said. Go, said the king of Aram, I will send along a letter to the king of Israel. So Naaman set out, taking along ten silver talents, six thousand gold pieces, and ten festal garments. The king of Israel, he brought the letter, which said, With this letter I am sending my servant Naaman to you, that you may cure him of his leprosy. When he read the letter, the king of Israel tore his garment and exclaimed, Am I a God with power over life and death that this man should send someone to me to cure me of, of the, be cured of leprosy? Take note, you can see he's only looking for a quarrel with me. When Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his garments, he sent word to the king, Why have you torn your garments? Let him come to me and find out that there is a prophet in Israel. Naaman came with his horses and chariots and stopped at the door of Elisha's house. The prophet sent them the message, Go and wash seven times in the Jordan, and your flesh will heal and you will be clean. But Naaman went away angry, saying, I thought he would surely come out and stand there to invoke the Lord his God, and would move his hand over the spot, and thus cure the leprosy. Are not the rivers of Damascus, the Albana, and the Afapar better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be cleansed? With this he turned about in anger and left. But his servants came up and reasoned with him, My father, they said, If the prophet had told you to do something extraordinary, would you have not done it? All the more now, since he said to you, Wash and be clean, should you do as he said? So Naaman went down and plunged into the Jordan seven times at the word of the man of God. His flesh became again like the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. He returned with his whole retinue to the man of God. On his arrival, he stood before him and said, Now I know there is no God in all the earth except in Israel. Verbum Domini A thirst is my soul for the living God. When shall I go and behold the face of God? As the hind longs for running water, so my soul longs for you, O God. A thirst is my soul for God, the living God. When shall I go and behold the face of God? Send forth your light and your fidelity shall lead me on and bring me to your holy mountain, to your dwelling place. Then will I go to the altar of God, the God of my gladness and joy. Then will I give you thanks upon the harp, O God, my God. Glory and praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. I hope in the Lord, I trust in his word. With him there is kindness and plenteous redemption. Glory and praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Dominus Rubiscum, Lexio Sancte Evangelii Segundum Lucum. Jesus said to the people in the synagogue at Nazareth, Amen, I say to you, no prophet is except in his own native place. Indeed, I tell you, there were many widows in Israel in the day of Elijah when the sky was closed for three and a half years and a severe famine spread over the entire land. It was to none of these that Elijah was sent, but only to the widow of Zarephath in the land of Sidon. Again, there were many lepers in Israel during the time of Elisha the prophet, yet not one of them was cleansed, but only Naaman the Syrian. 
When the people of the synagogue heard this, they were all filled with fury. They rose up, drove him out of the town, and led him to the brow of a hill on which their town had been built, to hurl him down headlong. But he passed through their midst of them and went away. Verbum Domini. Well, my brothers and sisters in Christ, see, the Jews had the Messiah in their midst, right? The Jews had been waiting for the Messiah in great anticipation, right? Great anticipation. This man shows up, performs boundless miracles, limitless miracles, raises people from the dead, preaches like they've never heard before, has authority over demons, right? Says that he is the Messiah, says that he is the Christ, says that he is the God, and they don't believe him. They don't believe him, right? They see these extraordinary things, and they don't believe him. And so Jesus tells this story about the widow of Zarephath, who Elijah goes in the, in the middle of the drought, performs a great miracle for her because she gives him, she trusted, she trusted, and gave him, Elijah, the great prophet, the last of what she had, believing that she would die after she gave it to him, but she gave it to him anyway. She was given a great miracle. And then Naaman, the prophet, uh, Naaman, I'm sorry, the uh, commander of the uh, king of Aram. He goes to Elisha. Now, of course, there's a confusion there and everything, but finally our Lord leads him to Elisha, and Elisha gives him a very simple command, go down to the Jordan. And uh, bathe uh, seven times, uh, immerse yourself seven times, you'll be washed clean. He doesn't believe it. But it's the simplicity, first of all, of the slave girl who tells him to go. She believed in Elisha, the prophet in Samaria, which was part of Israel. And and again, his, his servants who tell him, well... If he told you to do like this really difficult thing, wouldn't you do it, right? So Naaman goes and does this ordinary thing and he's healed. My brothers and sisters in Christ, I, I believe that we're always looking for extraordinary signs. Extraordinary signs. And I have come to believe that the extraordinary exists in the ordinary. If you take the Eucharist, right, the Eucharist, the extraordinary nature of the Eucharist is hidden in the bread and the wine. The body and blood of our Lord Savior Jesus Christ. God with us, Emmanuel with us. God, our Creator, our Savior, who walked the earth and died for our sins, was born unto man. Is here at every single Mass and every single tabernacle who we receive every single day in ordinary bread and wine. You know, my brothers and sisters in Christ, familiarity breeds contempt, and indeed, we become so familiar of the things of this world, these beautiful sunrises and beautiful sunsets and the ocean and the, the mountains, right, and the sky, the stars, and we fail to see Jesus in all of these. Not that Jesus, I'm not a, um, uh, what do they call it, a pantheon, uh, 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 a believer of pantheism. By no means. No, 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 no. But we should see the reality of Jesus in his creation. Do we truly believe that Christ, our God, our creator, our Messiah, is truly present in the Eucharist. The extraordinary is and the ordinary all around us, my brothers and sisters in Christ. I've said this many times, and I've given this homily many times, but I think it's important that we remember, get a reminder of, of 
seeing God, his beauty, his omnipotence, his love for us, his mercy for us in, in everything, including those who Jesus entrusts to our care each day. I've told you this, that when I was a child, I used to sit under a tree in my backyard. I used to lay down, actually, in the grass. We had beautiful grass in my backyard. I'm trying to grow such beautiful grass in my front yard here in Florida. But I used to lay down in the grass all by myself. My mother always used to say that I could occupy myself and use myself for hours, for hours. I used to look up at the heavens, at the clouds, the blue sky, and be in awe of what I saw. And I used to sit under the tree and I used to look at my finger and I would just move my finger like this and be amazed that I don't tell my finger to move. I don't tell my finger exactly what to do. I just think it. I just think it. And it just does it, right? And I think that that is like the most amazing thing our hands the most amazing thing that I just think what I want my hand to do and it does it in many instances, just does it automatically, right? And we're to believe that somehow this is a coincidence, right? This is evolution. No, it's nonsense. It's God. It's God. It's the omnipotence of God. It's the wonder of God and the ordinary things that we take for granted. So I think on this, my brothers and sisters in Christ, on Monday of the third week in Lent, as we move now towards Holy Week, very, very quickly, just a couple of weeks left, let us be mindful of God in all things, to see the God in all people that we meet, to see God in his creation. Again, not in a pantheistic way, but in an awesome way. That he gives us these signs of his omnipotence, his love, his mercy. And let us give thanks each and every single day. When we see the stars in the sky, the rain last night was just so beautiful. The sounding of the rain, the thunder and lightning. Do we get excited by everything that we see? Maybe it's because I'm getting older. I'll be 71 this coming week. I appreciate it, but I've always appreciated God's creation. I've always had a wonder of the Lord. May we always have that, that awesome wonder of the Lord, to see our Lord, to seek our Lord, and to ask him to bless us day in and day out, and most importantly, thank him for the blessings that he gives us day in and day out.